Gatekeeper, open the portals between the gods and mortals. Power freely flows as our magic grows. Ave Magna Mater. Hail Magna Mater, nature's mother, who bringeth all to life and revives all from day to day. The food of life you grant in eternal fertility. And when the soul hath retired, we take refuge in you, and all that you grant falls back to your womb. Rightfully you are called the mother of the gods, because by your loyalty you have conquered the power of the gods. Verily you are also the mother of the peoples and the gods. Without you, Nothing can thrive nor be. You are powerful. Of the gods, you are the queen and also the goddess. You, goddess, and your power I now invoke. You can easily grant me all that I ask. In exchange, I give you, goddess, this great wine. From the earth, everything rises. To the earth, everything returns. Hail, great mistress. Hail Magna Mater. Hail Magna Mater. I offer you this wine. Accept our offering. Accept our offering. Hi, I'm Aaron. And I'm Jonathan. And you're listening to Part the Mist. A podcast by a pair of 80th Druids here in Portland, Oregon. All right. So that was an interesting attempt at <laughs> invocation. We had some glitches in the recording process there. But, uh, Jonathan, why don't you tell us a bit about our deity of the occasion today? All right, great. Well, this is Magna Mutter. Um, she is an ancient goddess that came from an ancient Turkey. Magna Mutter, uh, you could trace her history back to about 9,000 years ago. So she is a really, really old goddess. Um, first, you know, you know, the Greeks took her over and kind of made her a Kybele. And then, and then the Romans came and through a, the Oracle of Delphi said that, oh, you know, this great, you have this great disaster happening. You need Kybele to be brought to Rome and then your disaster will stop. So she was brought over to Rome through prophecy, not so much as invasion or anything like mm-hmm. that. And the story goes is once Magna Mater came to Rome, the famine or I think it was famine or plague stopped. But, you know, we don't really know. Mm-hmm. Um, she's a goddess of liminal space between forests and cities. She's a goddess of um, of cities and city walls. Her crown is made of a city wall. If you look closely, I have a picture of her. Um, She's also of beasts. So in front of her are two uh, lioness, Mm -hmm. and they represent the wildness of uh, the beasts she controls. In one story, she she drums in the seasons, and there's a whole story with her and Addis, and that could take a whole podcast (laughs) talking about that story, which actually kind of leads into our topic, because Addis is considered a transgendered deity, or by, by, by some considered him a transgendered deity. Oh. That's a whole, whole another story right there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so th- there's a lot of information on her. There, there are huge books written on her, and we don't have enough time to really go into yeah. every detail of who Magna Mater is. That might be that might be a good uh, episode for uh, later times, though, because I really I I love your telling of the story of Magna Mater and and um, What's his name again? Addis. 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 But yeah, so uh, today we are going to be doing the second half of Core Order Ritual. Um, I don't really have, there's not a whole lot to tell beyond that. So have fun listening to us talk about the Core Order Ritual some more. Uh, I would like to take a moment to address uh, a couple things that have happened in June. It was a crazy month as, as, Everybody knows there's a ton of festivals going on. It also happens to be Pride Month. Was also the release of a certain anthology. I'm not going to go into too many details right now. Uh, I'm also not going to use this podcast as a platform for my personal politics. But in light of that certain anthology, I do want to take this time to say again that ADF and Columbia Grove are... uh, inclusive. We are inclusive of all races, all genders and gender identities, all sexualities, and all creeds. Uh, Basically, 
you are welcome within our organization. You are welcome within our grove. We are happy to have you as long as you're not running around and killing people. Uh, so I just wanted to take that moment again. A little bit of a darker moment, but just to, as a reminder in light of things that have been happening, that uh, we welcome you here. We're happy to have you here. Uh, I'm also going to be writing a piece for um, a, an upcoming anthology called uh, Tr Transpagan Life at the Intersection of Faith and Gender. That's going to be put out by Imanian, or Imanian Press and edited by D from uh, Pagan FM. So keep an eye out for that. I'll keep you guys updated on how things are going with that. But I'm really happy to have a, a part to do with this with this anthology. I'm excited to get a chance to uh, reach out to other trans pagans out there and share my story with you guys. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little bit. And, you know, by the time this uh, podcast is released, we are going to be starting to pack up and get ready for Beyond the Gates, our, our own festival. And Jonathan, what would you like to tell us about that? Oh, okay. Uh, so the festival is held at Trout Lake Abbey, which has a, both a Buddhist and a Druid sanctuary attached. The Druid is White Mountain Druid Sanctuary, and the other one is a Vietnamese Zen Buddhist monastery. So like I said, it's uh, July 7th to 10th. Right now, tickets again are $60 for the four days. Information on where to get tickets is on our website as well. The link will be in the show notes. Right. You can find information at ColumbiaADF.org. So some of our upcoming presenters for Beyond the Gates, we have Phaedra Bonowitz, who is Isaac Bonowitz's widow. We'll be presenting ritual participation skills as well as the life and times of Isaac Bonowitz. We also have uh, Reverend Kirk Thomas, who was the Arch Druid. He's presenting Celtic King Arthur, or who was he anyways, um, as well as the ancient Celtic religion. We also have Reverend uh, Melissa Birchfield with Sound and Ritual. Reverend William Ashton II, Humanity, the Fourth Kindred. We also have Amber Arani, who's doing a workshop on an ancient history of makeup and war paint, how to reclaim its ritualistic symbolism in contemporary times. I'm also leading a Fortuna blessing ritual. So we have a full weekend packed full of all these things going on, plus Bardic Night, plus an opening ritual, plus a main ritual. So we're going to be very busy, and that's coming up very soon. So we hope to see some of you guys out there. It'd be nice to meet some of you. And Absolutely. Pot potentially you could be on our podcast because we will be we will be recording some yes. of the workshops yeah. for our podcast here. So that's going to be very exciting. Uh, and I, like Jonathan said, Phaedra Bonowitz, Isaac Bonowitz's widow. We also have uh, Kirk Thomas, who uh, is our, was Arch Druid until a couple of months ago. Um, Melissa Birchfield is the uh, the bard, what is it, bard oh, laureate? Yes. Yes. Uh, and um, Amber, our very own Amber, uh, is doing the, the makeup presentation. So I'm really excited about this lineup of shows. What are a couple that you want to do? Well, I mean, we're going to be pretty busy, but I, Jonathan, what, what are the ones that you want to like listen to, check out for sure? The King Arthur one. Because that's a uh -huh. big thing within a lot of the ideas of what druids are and kind of talking about who was King Arthur, even yeah. if he existed or he didn't exist sort of things. I know, excuse me, I know that Kirk did a huge amount of research mm -hmm. research on, on King Arthur, so it's going to be interesting to hear what he has to say on that. I'm also interested in listening to The Fourth Kindred, which is a social mm -hmm. justice workshop. So that's, that's those are the ones I'm interested in. I might also step in and see Phaedra's stuff as well, but I have seen them in the past, so we will see on that. Yeah, I'm really excited about seeing the life and times of, of Isaac Bonowitz. It's kind of he has been such a huge part of my life this year. Between uh, reading his books, checking out his website, doing this podcast, so I'm really excited to check that one out for sure. Uh, plus the the sound and ritual, as you know, a bard myself, I am so psyched to check that out. All right, I guess we'll go ahead and move into our main topics. We're going to try to finish up the core order in this episode. 
we did a majority of the discussion with some of the major key raising parts. Um, so if you have not listened to part one, please do so before yes. continuing with this episode. If you are new, go, listen- ahead. go ahead and pause right now and go listen to part one. Yeah, do that. I was trying to give them silence to listen to. Okay, well, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you listen to that, you good, you back to us. Have you listened to all of our other podcasts as well? You don't have to have listened to them, but definitely listen to part one. Yes, that's a good idea. And if you want to know what more ADF is, we do have an episode on what is ADF. Yeah, yeah. So I think those two are the ones you want to check out first if you're starting. Yeah, and hopefully we're not going to be too, too long this time. No. So last time we did the, we discussed uh, opening the gates, which is our big energy raising part of our ritual. So the gates are opened. We're in the realm of the kindreds. We're, yeah, we are between the worlds now. Mm-hmm. And the three kindreds are the ancestors, nature spirits, and gods and goddesses. So let's go ahead and start with the with the ancestors. So the ancestors is actually broken up into three parts. We honor not just the ancestors of our blood, but we offer other ancestors as well. So there is the ancestors of our blood, which the ones that are your relatives. That's pretty straightforward, you know, your, your mom, dad, grandpa, your relatives. That's, that's pretty straightforward. We also honor the ancestors of spirit and or heart, which are those people that we look up to. Mm-hmm. So if, like, Abraham Lincoln was somebody that you really, really liked and looked up to him, you can consider him your spiritual ancestor. Mm-hmm. J.R.R. Tolkien for me. There you go. <laughs> so that's our spiritual ancestors we honor. Then, then there's a third set of ancestors, which is probably one of the harder ancestors to honor because we have no connection to them. It's the ancestors of bone or the ancestors of this land. Mm-hmm. It's the indigenous people who came and lived on the land before we came. So we are making offerings to them as well, even though we probably do not even know who they are. Mm-hmm. We're still we're on their land. We're still making offerings to them mm-hmm. to honor them and their spirits as well. So if you are sitting there thinking you might want to make an offering for uh, the victims of Orlando with the upcoming, you know, with your next ritual, what would that be? Ancestors of Spirit and Heart? Uh, yeah, that'd be Ancestors of Spirit and Heart. Mm-hmm. So that's pretty straightforward with the ancestors. That's Yeah. Then we got the nature spirits. Next is the nature spirits. Now the nature spirits are all living things here. You know, those, those, those animals that fly, crawl, walk, swim, bacteria, fungus, plants, pretty much everything is that is the nature spirits, along with the whites, which are Norse, mm-hmm. um, the, the fey, she, mm-hmm. the lares for Roman, as well as, you know, the, the little people and stuff mm-hmm. like that, the, the fey folk. The, the wee gentlemen, as, as, as we would call them in Ireland. Yes, <laughs> there you go. So those are also the wee the, gentle folk, rather. Those are the nature spirits as well. We honor them. And then there are the gods and goddesses. And when we honor the gods and goddesses in our rituals, we are sending out an invite to all the gods and goddesses, regardless if they show up or not. It's an open invitation. It isn't just specifically for the hearth culture being practiced at this ritual. We are so we're offering, we are making offerings to all the gods and goddesses of all the folk who are gathered here today. Mm-hmm. To make sure that we do cover everybody and we're being as hospitable as possible. Yes. So I think the three kindreds in itself are pretty self-explanatory. Um, I don't. There's not a whole lot more. They, they are a big deal. They are some of the biggest deal things that we do in our ritual because we cons- consistently make offerings to them. Yes. But the concept themselves, I think, is pretty straightforward because I know a lot of traditions actually honor these mm-hmm. these, these kindreds. We just mm-hmm. we just lump them together. So a kindred is one of the three kindreds. Uh, so, so when you talk about the three, it's not the three kindred; it's the three kindreds. I, I got marked down in some of my work, but not putting that S up it. But yeah, do so, it noted. So for those of you working on your dedicant path, the, it's three kindreds, one kindred. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's yeah, exactly. When do we honor the three kindreds? We honor them immediately after the gates have been opened. Before we do anything else, we honor the kindreds. And there are a multitude of ways to honor them. Invocation, written and spoken invocations are the most common. Chants and songs. Chants and songs, maybe 
You do some sort of theater as well, as mm -hmm. well as meditations mm -hmm. are also used. Give an example of three invocations during three different rituals for the three kindreds, and then we'll go from there. So we'll start with the first invocation to the ancestors. The children of the earth call out to the mighty dead. Greetings, ancestors and divine dead. You who were here before, we offer you welcome. Ancestors of our blood, we offer you welcome. You who guide us, we offer you welcome. Come to our hearth, ancestors. Guide us and ward us as we walk the elder ways. Ancestors, accept our offering. Ancestors, accept our offering. So something to now the nature spirits. The children of the earth call out to the spirits of this land. Kindred of earth, we offer you welcome. Kindred of growing green, we offer you welcome. Kindred who fly or walk or swim or crawl, we offer you welcome. Come to our fire spirits. Guide us and ward us as we walk the elder ways. Nature spirits, accept our offering. And then finally, the gods and goddesses. The children of the earth call out to the gods and goddesses. To all the gods and goddesses, we offer you welcome. To all the gods of this place, we offer you welcome. To all the deities of this land, we offer you welcome. Come to our hearth, gods and goddesses. Guide us and ward us as we walk the elder ways. So that is a basic example of the three kindreds invocations. Now, they can be very long. They can be very short. It is primarily what most people do. And there's added on things you can do. In Colombia, for instance, we do the invocation. We have a song we sing that everybody in the grove sings. And we also do a guided meditation as well. Um, so for the ancestors, we sing mothers and fathers of old. Do you mind saying that for us? From far beyond this mortal plane, mothers and fathers of old, we pray that you return again. Mothers and fathers of old, to share with us the mysteries and secrets long untold. Of ancient ways we seek to reclaim, mothers and fathers of old. Excellent. We also have our nature spirit song. Fur and feather and scale and skin, Different without, but the same within. Many of body, but one of soul. Through all creatures are we made whole. And finally, our gods and goddesses song. Hail all the gods. Hail all the goddesses. Hail all the holy ones. We dwell together. Powers of the sky. Powers of the sacred earth. Powers of the underworld, we dwell together. Hail all the gods, hail all the goddesses, hail all the gods and goddesses. Hail all the gods, hail all the goddesses, hail all the holy ones, we dwell together. Most excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah. Here, have some water. Oh, I thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Oh. Trying to sing that last one. Ugh. All right. So once we've done our invocation, once we've sung the song, we also do a meditation to kind of get everyone thinking and seeing in their mind's eye the three kindreds approaching. So for the ancestors, you might, if you're interested in using this method, you might say something like, Children of the earth, close your eyes. From the edge of the space, you see shadows all around you. You hear their voices murmurs in the background. Take a moment to invite your ancestors to commune with you. Feel them. Their blood pounds in your veins. Their flesh is your flesh. Their echoes whisper within your soul. Feel them as they impart their wisdom upon you. Together we say, Ancestors, we welcome you. Ancestors, we welcome you. And next is the nature spirits. Children of the earth, close your eyes. The ancestors are with us. They now move aside to let the nature spirits join us as well. Feel them scamper about or watch from hollows within the earth and caverns beneath the sea. They are here. 
the little folk of earth, sea, and sky, and home. Lend them your voice, for they have much to say, if only you will take the time to listen. And together we say, nature spirits, we welcome you. Nature spirits, we welcome you. And finally, for our gods and goddesses, children of the earth, close your eyes. The ancestors and nature spirits are with us now, just now. Walking towards you are 15-foot-tall glowing beings. Feel their love. Feel their strength. Feel their glow. And take just a moment to be with the gods and goddesses as they join us here this day. Gods and goddesses, we welcome you. Gods and goddesses, we welcome you. Now, usually we wait about 10 to 15 seconds before we say that. Uh, so allows people to actually commune with the spirits. Right. So that's 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 pretty much for the seven uh, for the seven hall for the the three kindreds. So that's pretty much for the three kindreds. Uh, within Columbia Grove, also we use this opportunity as a chance to bring in any attendees who might want to have a part. Before we get into uh, our actual ritual, we will hand out the invocations to the ancestors, the nature spirits, and the shining ones. For members of the of the ritual to read who might not necessarily have had a part. Yeah, we, we ourselves, members, don't take the kindreds, like no. you said. We feel like it's a great way for the community to connect to ritual when they themselves are representing the kindreds mm -hmm. on all of our behalf. So it's not so much just them witnessing the, the rite, they're actually taking an active participation role. Right. And a lot of the times, it's usually kids who come up and take the kindreds' parts mm -hmm. for us. So it's, so it's really nice seeing the kids getting involved. When a kid comes up and do it, does it, though, make sure you listen extra close because they talk quietly. <laughs> yeah, some of them are quite, are quite quiet. Um, but, yeah, so that is part seven, the kindreds, key offerings. Now for the heart of the rite. Everything prior has been leading up to this point. The grove has been established in the earth and the cosmos. The gates have been swung wide open, and the kindreds have been invited. Now is the time for worship. So since I've spoken quite a bit in the last recording and I just did the last step, I'm going to go ahead and Arn, would you mind talking about the key offerings portion? Sure, yeah. So now we have the heart of the rite. Everything prior has been leading up to this point. The grove has been established in earth and cosmos. The gates have been opened and the kindreds have been invited. Now is the time for worship. Step eight presents offerings to specific beings. Now, these beings are called the beings of the occasion. They are primary recipients of worship, and rites usually center around them. For example, an Irish Lunasa might center around Lu, or a Roman Saturnalia will center around Saturn. These beings of the occasion are also called deities of the occasion, or, uh, although they can also be ancestors or nature spirits, as well as deities. Patrons of the occasion might be another synonym in other words you might use for that and then uh it's not to be confused with a personal patron which is a power with whom you have developed a special relationship the deities of the occasion are more beings invited to be guests of honor and presiding powers as guests of honor they receive praise works of art material offerings and the like as presiding powers, they bless celebrations, witness oaths, guide initiations, power workings, and so on. The deities of the occasion arrive via the gates, just as the three kindreds do. Your invitations and invocations may be much like those for the kindreds, only more elaborate. Another possibility, less common but suitable to beginner's worship, is to worship the three kindreds generally. Specifically, specific deities of the occasion are not named. Rather, the three kindreds become the deities of the occasion. In this case, step eight merges with step seven. It's also possible to give offerings to beings other than the deities of the occasion. For example, you may wish to offer to your personal patron, even if that being is not directly related to the occasion. This is a bit of a controversy in ADF currently. Some feel that too many... Three, two, one. Some feel that too many of these offerings can overshadow the deity of the occasion in importance. The deity of the occasion should receive the lion's share of attention. Others feel we should be feel... Three, two, one. 
Others feel we should be free to offer as much as we like to whomever we like, so long as the deity of the occasion receives something too. The debate is not over forbidding non-deity of the occasion offerings, but rather over striking a res uh, respectful balance. In addition to offerings, the seasonal customs may also be included in step eight. For example, lighting the Yule log at a Norse winter solstice, or jumping over the need fire at Celtic Beltane would be appropriate. Such customs do not necessarily need to relate to the deity of the occasion, but should obviously relate to the time of the year. Depending on the style of your rite, seasonal customs may even co constitute the main fair. This will lend more of a folk fair to the ritual, as opposed to the ceremonious tone of a rite that is many offerings, mostly offerings. Okay, so thank you, Arn, for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, I am... Um, <laughs> Previously, I had some hard times reading certain parts. I'm like, you know what, you could go ahead and read this. Um, so what what these uh, key offerings, you got, you know, the beings of the occasion, deities of the occasion, the seasonal customs, as well as praise offerings. But we'll get to praise offerings in a moment. We'll talk about the deities of the occasion. There are a multitude of ways and multitude of gods, goddesses, ancestors, and nature spirits to be honored in core order of ritual ADF rituals there so it'd be too it would take too long for us to list all the mm -hmm. possibilities even for the <laughs> even for the eight high days uh, but typically like at Beltane you'll dance the maypole you'll honor um like for instance we honored Anye and Anye and the she yes and for our Lunasa ritual we'll honor Lou for for our Lunasa ritual we honor Lou and his foster mother Tiaosu with games. There you go. <laughs> so it's so it depends on what you want to do and who you'd like to honor. Now the offerings you can make to the deities of the occasion could range from song, material offerings, poetry, we've done dance. dance. <laughs> we've done a passion play at our Hellenic uh, spring equinox mm -hmm. ritual with Demeter and Cor yeah, Demeter yeah. and Corey. Uh, it, it all, I mean, a lot of things can happen. This is where the main performance of the ritual is happening. This mm -hmm. is, like you mentioned, Oren, that this is where the bulk of her stuff is going to happen. Right, right. Um, not just, you know, I, I highly recommend if you're going to be honoring a deity of the occasion, a simple two-line invocation might not cut it. More mm -hmm. effort should be put into this because this is the major, mm -hmm. this is the major deity of the ritual. Mm -hmm. Um and, and I highly recommend those who are out there doing this to have some parts of the scripted out or at least memorize. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, it becomes, you want, you, people are going to your rituals if you're doing public rituals to honor these deities specifically. I know that when we do a Beltane ritual, these specific she and everyone, mm -hmm. people want to honor those specifically. Mm -hmm. They might not know about the three kindreds. They might not know about all the other parts, the earth, none of that, but they're there specifically for that. Mm -hmm. So as a way to honor both the deities and your community, you want to put a lot, lot of effort into writing this main part on step eight. But I mean, that goes for solitary rituals too. Mm -hmm. I know I've done, I've done a handful of solitary rituals since I've come to ADF. Um, not being much of a solitary practitioner myself, but I know having something written down, something to refer to helps me so much. I, I, I know where I'm going. And then I feel like I'm focusing more on being respectful to the deities than I am on, oh, gee, did I do that right? One of the important things you need to note um, which is a pretty much a noticeable feature of ADF rituals is that the material offerings that you are making are often intentionally destroyed in the process of offering. You know, flowers are burnt in fire, jewelry is broken before dropped into the well, cups are smashed, knives are bent. Um, this practice is modeled directly on the ancient Indo-European practices and emphasizes the final finality of the offering. That which is destroyed cannot be taken back. Um, it is not required, however, that you destroy offerings in this way. The important thing is that offerings go out of your hands permanently. So that's the one big thing we need to stress because we've had people in ritual try to retrieve the things that they've yes. thrown in the fire and in the well. Once you make offerings, it is to them. Mm -hmm. you, you really, this might it's, sound a little dogmatic, but you can't reuse offerings that you made off. I can't give you a gift arm and then tell me, well, I want that back now. Right, right. 
So that's something that you really need to keep in mind as an offering. Once you're given, give it, it's done. Uh -huh. It's not yours anymore. So be very careful of what you give. Mm -hmm. if, are, are you willing to sacrifice this excellent necklace? Yeah. Are you, are you willing to – just because we say give give of your bounty doesn't mean that you have to give us your – give your favorite necklace unless you are absolutely willing to have that necklace taken out of your use forever. Mm -hmm. So that is – so that's dealing with the deities of the occasion. And if you have any questions on that – and need some help possibly with rituals, contact us and we can help you Absolutely. out. We just don't want to spend too much time talking about the variety of things you could do at this point. Okay. Now, the training course on the core order of ritual combines the uh, beings of the occasion and praise offerings in one step. So let's go ahead and talk okay. about the praise offering. The praise offerings, in my opinion, I think is the most important part of our ADF public ritual. I agree. Absolutely. The uh, people come to our rites specifically for this reason. The idea is, is we have the three kindreds here. We have the deity of, of the occasion. And now is the time for the community as a whole to come up and make offerings to any of their kindreds as well as the being of occasion, beings of occasion. Traditionally, this was people would do praise offerings only to the beings of the occasion, but has evolved into you could come up and invite your gods and goddesses to this ritual, mm -hmm. your ancestors, your nature spirits. Um, we used to, when we used to do this, we used to, we used to have a smaller amount. We used to have like 25 to 30 people. We would have a wreath everybody would hold on to, and we'd have people come up individually up and make offerings, mm -hmm. holding a wreath to put their power into that wreath as well. So they're holding a wreath. They're coming up and making the praise offerings to whoever. Um, you know, the... the so, and we'll get, a little bit later, we'll get to what that wreath is for. Yes, yes. So bear with us on this. So we, so they're holding the wreath and they're making offerings. You know, if it's to their ancestors, to the well, gods and goddesses, to the fire, nature spirits, to the tree. And it's great. You know, having individuals come up and say something or say nothing is great with a smaller group. However, when Columbia has gone up to now 45 to 82 people, we have everybody come up as once to make the, their oh, praise mass. offerings. Yes, in mass. <laughs> Come up, and actually, a lot of people seem to like that better because a lot of less stress, yeah. and people aren't watching them it, instead. Yeah, it's a lot better if you're an introvert too, I think, or if you have social anxiety, then you get to be part of the group doing the thing instead of having to be up there in front mm -hmm. of everybody. And I mean, even when we had the opportunity, you know, if you want to give a silent offering, uh, come up in mass now, and then other people can make individual offerings. It still was very kind of awkward for people, so I think they like I think they like this a little bit better. Although I, I personally kind of miss the old way. But we do also give our attendees the opportunity to, to come up to us beforehand if they want to do a praise offering that may involve song or dance or something, a performance aspect. Then they can come up to us beforehand, before the ritual and let us know, and we'll make sure that they get the opportunity to do that as well. So there's really two ways that you do the praise offering. Now, if you're doing a solitary thing, you wouldn't need to do the praise offering because you're already doing praise offerings. Usually for your deity of the occasion is usually your patron. From at least, at least my practice, it was that way. You can do the, 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 the eight high days as well. But praise offerings, I think, is more tailored to the public. At least in my eyes, I see it's more tailored to the public. I think you can do praise offerings if you're doing, like, for instance, Beltane, or for me, uh, in bulk, I have no relation to Bridget at all, but so I would still do uh, praise mm. offerings. Okay, cool. That makes sense. Yeah. Uh, so there's two ways to do it, uh, at least two ways that we've, we've done. I mean, there, there might be multiple ways, but the ones that I've seen has people coming up in mass and people coming up individually. Mm -hmm. So we also have an offering song that we sing during the praise offering. And they sing it in the around usually, is that correct? Yeah, we... Uh... Or, you know, actually, I guess it's the, the Call of the Spirits that we sing around right now. But uh, So the song that we usually sing while people are doing their offerings is, Let our voices arise on the fire. Let our voices resound in the deep. May the spirits accept what we offer as we honor the old ways we keep. And you guys keep singing that over and over, over and over. And over yeah. It usually takes a couple of minutes. I mean, everyone comes up pretty quickly, but 
this, at least in my opinion, again, is very important. And, the commu- and it really builds a community because from my experience going to other public rituals, I never had the opportunity to honor my gods, right. my ancestors, and nature right. spirits in ritual. So this is kind of a unique thing in ADF. I right. haven't seen it in a whole other rituals. So I think this is pretty unique in that expect that you could come up and make this ritual also a part of you, too. Right. Yeah, I haven't seen that in any other rituals either. No. Okay. So we moving on moving. to part nine. Part nine, it is the prayer of sacrifice. So everything done up to this point comes to a head in the prayer of sacrifice. The cosmos have been recreated, the kindreds have been invited, and all the key offerings have been made. And now is a time to sum up all that power and focus into a single intent. This is what Isaac called the moment of supreme tension. As one member puts it. It's the exclamation point on the whole offering section. As, these, as this makes clear, it's the culmination, climax, and grand finale. With it, the first half of the ritual, the sending of energy is pretty much complete. So here's where we go, go back to that wreath we were talking about. Mm-hmm. So when everyone comes up and touches the wreath, uh, they're putting their energy into it mm-hmm. as our final offering. Now, we also go around for those people who haven't done praise offerings, mm-hmm. for them to put their energy into the reef as well. Mm-hmm. So at this point, all the offerings, all the inv- inviting and everything at this point is where we're almost done. And we're about to receive our blessings in return. So we have the reef. We have everything ready to go. Okay, so we have the reef in our hand. And then we say this final invocation. This final praise. O noble ancient gods and goddesses, offerings we have offered to your shrines. Offerings have we made through the well, fire, and tree. Kindreds, all this we give to you in the name of hospitality. May our piety increase your magic. May our courage increase your power. And may our fertile spirit show the world your abundance. Mighty kindreds, accept our sacrifice. Now, this is what, what makes it a little different is throughout our ritual, when we're making offerings, we're saying accept our offerings because there are many offerings. The fact that we're saying accept our sacrifice, it's the final offering. So the word sacrifice sometimes gets confused and thrown around, but sacrifice it literally means the last offering you will make. Mm-hmm. To bring in Christianity, for instance, Jesus was considered, when he sacrificed himself, he was supposed to be the final offering mm-hmm. on all of our sins and stuff like that. Right. So he was the final sacrifice. Right. So in our rituals, with the prayer of sacrifice, that is the final offering. Right. And that's very important. That, that, that pretty much we, right now, at the top of the power level, and now it's time for us to receive our blessings in return. So in ancient times, you know, both the prayer and sacrifice was crucial to all Indo-European rituals. They often went hand in hand. Like, for instance, the Greeks, for, for the Greeks, the one was almost always accomplished by the other. Um, Seleucius, a Roman writing in the 4th century, said that the sacrifice gives life to the words. You know, mo- modern monotheistic religions may lead us to believe prayer to be introspective and confessional. However, prayer in ancient days was much more about the presentation of offering than introspection and confession. Um, step 9 of the ADF rituals today employs a style closer to the ancient ways. And, you know, there's other, other examples how to do a prayer of sacrifice. You know, if you're doing a Greek ritual, you could say something to the extent of, with the aid of the mighty Hermes, I open the ways. I have given freely with devotion, love, and praise. Here I stand between, here I stand before you with open heart ablaze. Holy ones, accept more offerings. So there's a bunch of ways, a bunch of ways you could end the offering stage. Mm-hmm. The method we explained here with the the first invocation we give is the way Columbia does it. We mm-hmm. do it as pretty much standard with how ADF does it. So there's mm-hmm. really no differences of how we do it. Right. Um, but there's one more thing you could do right before the prayer of sacrifice. My you, favorite. You could do the, <laughs> oops, I, oops, if we screwed up, we could give you another offering. It's the piacular offering. I like to call it the puck offering. If you've ever seen or read Shakespeare's Midsummer Night Dream, 
the 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 monologue that Puck delivers at the end. It's very similar to that. If we've offended you, please forgive us. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's the pretty much it was the piacular offering was very common in Roman rituals. Mm-hmm. So it was like, yeah, oops, it's that oops, we effed up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if you effed up, you know, so so we try to do that. Columbia does one at every ritual, mm. just out of respect, just in case we messed up. And ours goes something like this. Gods and goddesses, nature spirits, ancestors, if anything that we have done here has offended you, if anything we have done here has been incomplete, if anything we have done here has not been made in the proper matter, accept this final offering in recompense. And that's pretty much it. We just make another offering to the well fire and tree. Mm-hmm. And it's like, this is the second one. Mm-hmm. And then we go ahead and do the prayer of sacrifice. Right. It's, there's not a whole lot to talk about that other than it was very big in Mediterranean mm-hmm. religions. And I think it's a good safe bet to play as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So that right there was the, the prayer of sacrifice. <laughs> one, two, three. Trust in no man's razors We have nicked and cut ourselves We've been stung by all the aftershaves Upon the drugstore shelves And our patience and endurance From late puberty till now Have given us the strength to make this vow We won't shave any longer Our beards are stronger Hi, I'm David, and you're listening to Part the Mist, a druid podcast created and hosted by members of Columbia ADF. Step 10, The Omen.
The omen is a very important step. Up until this moment, attention has been showered upon the kindreds. Now is the time for them to speak in response. The omen allows clear and structured communication to take place between the worshiper and the worshipee. Worshipped. <laughs> Furthermore, the omen augments the mood of the return flow. Uh, this is kind of, we're going back to that concept of ghosty here. I give so that I receive. I get, I've been giving you all of these offerings, now give me your omen. So this definitely takes place after all of the offerings have been made, but before the blessings are received, because it's, it's the way of the kindreds communicating with you. It occurs as the ritual is turning from the sending of energy to the return flow. At this liminal point, the kindreds speak. Um, there's a lot of different techniques and way to do it. Um, the most common is with a tarot deck. Um, you can ask a question and have that answered, or you can just have the, the kindreds speak, uh, draw an omen for each of the kindreds. What's very common in a lot of our Celtic uh, groves is to use the ogham. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of our Norse using the runes. Mm -hmm. uh, some, of the, some of the Greeks and Romans, um, they, uh, they pull sticks. I've seen a multitude of ways you can take the omen, but like you said, it's all about their communicating to us directly, mm -hmm. having a direct communication to us. Most traditionally within Columbia Grove, we do it using a tarot deck. Yes, it's the most familiar. I mean, we're trying to branch out, but we yes. feel that in order for us to, to be right with the community, we really need to know the system being used versus something we're just going to have a book with us all the time. Mm -hmm. Our seer, she's really, really good at reading the tarot, so she doesn't need to use any uh, material to help her um, interpret the card. So you mm -hmm. get a clear meaning, not worrying so much of, oh, what does this mean? Like, it means hospitality. Like, well, you know, it, she gets she gets the inspiration there, and she's able to dissect what they say and then tell all of us. Mm -hmm. So so in ancient times, yes, taking omens were huge. Yes. Uh, we, we know for the uh, we know for a fact that the Greeks and Romans did that because it's written down everywhere. So we know that they took the auspices, they looked at birds, they did entrail readings for omens. So that's so so the ancient people. I know the Celts did it too. Yeah, we're we're a little bit less certain about ways. I mean, we talk about using the omens or the runes for the Celts and the Norse. There's no evidence. Uh, Oum was really just a written language for the Celts. There's no evidence of them using it as a form of divination or omen taking at all but um we do know that they that they did take omens uh for example there was one instance with a fox being loosed from some lady's cloak or something i'm sorry i don't know that exact story off the top of my head but uh basically that told her that uh it was bochea actually mm -hmm. told her that she was going to win the war and sure enough she did so um we do definitely know that uh, the celts did i can't speak Exactly on the Norse, but I'm sure they did as well. So that usually does come first between all the other blessings taking the omen. Yes. So, so how we normally do it is that we have a couple steps with taking the omen. Um, we have a we have a song we sing. We generally started out with singing a, a quick um, omen song. Offered our gifts go to the gods, growing the gods receive our love. Listen, the seer learns our fate, flowing the blessings come to us. And the other way is we have a spoken word. We have something, something like, may we be open to the ancestors, asking what blessings they have for us in return and the needs they have for us. Now, that was for our ancestor ritual. Mm -hmm. Or it could be maybe open to the kindreds, asking what blessings they offer us in return and the needs they have mm -hmm. for us. So either way, either way. Um, and then the seer will go ahead for us and pull three cards, mm -hmm. uh, one, starting usually with the ancestors, the nature spirits, and gods and goddesses. And once she has given for all three, she will do a summary mm -hmm. and what they all mean together. Mm -hmm. And... and and then and ask. Then she will ask the community, "Do you accept 
what the kindreds have offered to you. Mm -hmm. Because as we're all about reciprocity and hospitality, right. we do not have to accept what the kindreds have given to us. So if you don't like the offering, you do not have to accept it. Right. Yes. The omen. The omen, sorry. <laughs> yes, you do not have to accept the omen if that is not something you wish. Mm -hmm. And that can be kind of controversial a little bit, but at the same time, it, you don't have to accept all gifts from people. Right. And the way we're working within the system is that it has to be freely given and freely taken. Right. So, so we ask, do you accept mm -hmm. yes or no? And sometimes we have to be like, you know, God, do you, do you, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Sometimes we have to encourage people to say something. <laughs> yes. Right. And it has to be, and it has to be verbal so they can hear yes. us. Yeah. Um, and at least, at least from my understanding, is not all these spirits could read minds, so saying it is preferred. Right. So that's pretty much that. Pretty much summarizes the step eleven, and now we're on to step twelve: is hollowing the blessings. So the previous step calls for the blessings, and this step realizes their arrival. To hollow is to make holy or sacred. So the blessings now come to us into the blessing cup and permeate the beverage within. The drink is imbued with holiness and sacred power. It is no longer mundane, and the waters become the waters of life. Although this form comes from whiskey, ADF uses it for any beverage hollowed in the blessing cup. The waters of life will shortly be consumed. The actual moment of consumption is unspecified in the court of ritual since it takes time for large groups to pass the cup around in this situation will dictate exactly how it is done. Suffice it to say consumption falls somewhere between the hallowing of the the hallowing and the affirmation, but never before the hallowing. For our purposes we will discuss consumption after affirmation. So there are there are a couple ways to do this. Um, the, the most common way to hollow hollow the waters, for instance, like an example, is so so what we do in Columbia is we don't pass around a single cup. I don't know about you, Arn, but the idea no. of all drinking through one cup is kind <laughs> of disgusting to me, considering that I don't know what everybody has. And when we have like 60 people sharing a cup, even if it's alcohol in there, does it mean yeah. that alcohol will necessarily touch the part that needs to be sanitized? And we'd like to be considerate of anybody who might be a germaphobe coming to our ritual or anybody who doesn't drink alcohol. Mm. <laughs> so what we do is we first, before we hollow, before we do this, we pass out a bunch of glass, shot glasses. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we pass them all out to everybody um, before we do this. So it just kind of runs a little smoothly. Mm -hmm. So once we've done that, we have usually a couple of pitchers of alcoholic beverage and one with water only for those who don't drink. Mm -hmm. And how we tend to do this is we have a couple of our group members holding the waters in the air. So we'll have a couple people holding the pictures up, and we could say something like, Oh, mighty noble and shining ones, we have given to you. And now we ask you to bless us in turn. As a gift calls for a gift, hollow these waters, all holy powers. Grant us the blessings we seek. Let the wisdom, love, and power of the gods, dead, and nature spirits flow in this cup of blessings. Behold the waters of life. And then usually everyone says, behold the waters of life. There's another method we tend to do too. It's a little bit different than that. So that was one way I mentioned before how, how we used to do it. But instead we do things a little different. Once we pass out the cups, somebody leading the ritual will say, we have made offerings to the kindreds, and now we shall ask for their blessings in return. Close your eyes. See the blessings that each of you desire and need from the kindreds. See it clearly in your mind's eye. And when we ask for the waters of life, when we say, give us the waters of life, see the blessings you desire transcend into your empty cup like a mist, filling the cup. And when we drink of the waters, you will receive your blessing. When you're ready to receive your blessings, you can open your eyes. Now, kindreds, your children call out, give us the waters. And everyone will say, give us give the, us waters. the waters. waters. Again, your children call out, give us the waters. Give us the waters. And now, give us the waters of life. Give us the waters of life. So that is pretty much the 12th part, the hollowing the blessings.
And now we move on to the 13th part, which is the affirming of the blessings. So there are two main functions of step 13, confirmation and integration. We'll discuss confirmation first. It means the full acceptance of what the kindreds give. There are two general styles of doing this, performed before or after consuming the waters of life, respectively. If before you're drinking, it, it is as if to say, yes, I accept that which is offered to me. If you use the omen questioning style, what blessings are offered to us, then you know what you are accepting, and it makes sense to use that, this option. The other option is after drinking, as if to say, I have drunk and it is within me. This could be used with either omen question. The two styles share the same basic meaning, but the feeling is different. With the first style, the feeling is that is that of receiving, and you can feel the electricity of anticipation. With the second type, the feeling is that of having the power of the kindreds within you, and you can express the joy and beauty and jubilation of that. Now let's look at integration. To integrate the blessings is to digest them physically, mentally, and spiritually. So it begins with the physical consumption of the beverage. At the same time, on the mental and spiritual levels, the worshiper may meditate on the feeling of communion or contemplate the meaning of the uh, or contemplate the meaning of the blessing for his or her life. In this way, the blessings are fully diffused throughout the whole being of the devotee. Finally, some concluding words may be said to remind participants of the blessing's relevance to the ritual, season, grove, or the world at present. The blessings are thus integrated not only into the worshiper, but into the total context of life. Confirmation and integration do not necessarily need to be done with separate phrases or actions, but attention should be given to both in designing step 13. So they broke down the, uh, the blessing cup into three different sections. But when we do ritual, we obviously don't break them up. It just flows all in. Because right. at least in our experience, if we break it up, it seems kind of choppy. Right. So when I'm trying to figure out what we did, it's like, okay, where do we have to break this up? Because we just do it all at once. Mm -hmm. So what this last part just puts in the other parts together. So I'm going to go ahead and read to you what we do. First, we had people... Visualize the blessings pouring into their cup. Then we ask the people to call out to the kindreds, give us the water. And now it's time to affirm these blessings and fill these waters with the actual blessings. So how Columbia does it is we, we do something like this. Ancestors, may you fill these waters with the blessing of whatever the ancestor omen card was. Nature spirits. May you fill these waters with the blessing of whatever the omen card was. Gods and goddesses, may you fill these waters with the blessing of whatever the omen card mm -hmm. was. Then once that's done, we ask, children of earth, do you accept these blessings from the kindreds? You know, people will say, we do. You, again, you don't have to accept them. We have some, you had some people who were not used to this level, did not accept the blessings, mm -hmm. didn't want to partake in the blessing, and mm -hmm. that is perfectly fine. And then we will say, then you shall have them. And we have a blessing cup song that we usually sing. Yes. And so actually what we do is we will sing this while the, the uh, blessings are being poured for everyone. Um, and this one we sing in a round. For the waters raise the cup, drink your share of wisdom, deep strength and joy now fill us up. As the elder ways we keep. And seeing that over and over again, usually with some sort of dancing maneuver to keep things more... <laughs> <laughs> more flowing. And, flowing yeah. and happy and not starting to sound like a dirge. <laughs> but there is a dirge version of that song they use for Samhain. Yeah. We don't use a song for Samhain for our ancestor ritual because I didn't <laughs> want that kind of singing going on. So once everyone's got the water, we'll usually toast to the kindred and the beings of the occasion. And then we say, and now let us take a moment in silence with the powers of the kindreds in us, visualize their blessings and reflect on how it manifests itself within our lives. That is a way that Columbia does. And there's a multitude of ways. And, they, and there's a huge, I'm looking online, there's a huge list of ways yeah. to do this. 
I encourage you, if you're an ADF member, to go and look at that because we could spend a lot of time talking about the um, logistics on this. And we have the link in the show notes for last episode, but we'll make sure to post that for you in these show notes as well, again. Um, so, in ancient times, this stuff was very important. Sharing the meal, having meals blessed with the energy of those you made offering to, alcohol being blessing and passed around, that's that's very, very common in most ancient cultures. Yeah. Um, and that, there's not a whole lot of details other than this is very, very important, that we're all sharing these blessings together as a community. Mm-hmm. After the blessing cup, we get to step 14, which is workings. If there's any kind of workings involved, this could be dancing the maypole. This could be, this could be um, a, a, a well blessing with, with a vrish for imbolc. Yeah. This can be a... Um, a sun blessing for... Summer solstice. solstice. This could be trance uh, dancing, static dancing for mm-hmm. di- our Dionysus ritual. Mm-hmm. So if there's any special work to be done for your ritual, such as a rite of passage, initiation, oath, healing, weather working, spell casting, now is the time to do it. This step is set aside for more elaborate prayers and magical actions than other steps can accommodate. The workings need not necessarily bear directly on the nature of the rite. Naturally, it would be good if rite and works and workings suited each other. You'd have more power to call for rain if the main rite focused on a weather deity. But needs arise suddenly, and it's not always possible to wait for the perfect opportunity. Furthermore, one of the original intentions of calling to all three kindreds in Step 7 is so that you would always have some power gathered for any purpose. Out of those kindreds, at least some will be weather powers, and so you can always call for rain. Thus, you can do workings regardless of the nature of the overall rite. If there are no workings, which may frequently be the case, then you may skip to the next step. The sacrifice has empowered the kindreds, and the blessings have empowered the participants, so the rite is always full and complete without any workings. It is in no way wasted energy. For the um, high days, there's usually, at least in my experience, there's usually some sort of working, some sort of something happening, like I said, with the, yeah. with the, uh, with the maypole being danced. But if yeah. it comes to like a solitary rite, you don't need to do anything. Right. Um, even some of our, um, what we're going to plan on doing in the future is have monthly rituals with our high day rituals, where it'll simply be, we're calling on the kindreds, and there's going to be no beings of the occasion, there's going to be no working, it's just specifically a blessing ritual. Mm -hmm. So it is perfectly fine not having any workings. Um, Oathing for ADF seems to be very popular in the fact that people who completed the dedicant for oath path, they have to do a final oath usually in front of a community, and this is a good time for that Mm -hmm. to happen. Um, But other than that, this is pretty straightforward. This is what you'll do your high day celebration. Mm -hmm. This is the part you do it. So I think, do you have anything to add before I move on? No. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah, and we're we're starting to, we're starting to finish the rite at this yes. point. Yes. Yeah, we're we're coming around towards the end of uh, our core order ritual now. So we're at step fifteen, which is thanking the beings, and the reason we thank them is because we're hospitable hosts. We are not dismissing. That's one thing that that I think Arn's going to to mention is we are not dismissing deities. We are not dismissing anybody. We're we are, not being rude. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can understand certain things yeah. dismissing, but the fact that we invited them here, we want, we don't know if they're going to show up. Right. So we don't want to assume that, but we want to thank them. Mm-hmm. The ritual drama reaches its climax in the blessings, and then in step 15 begins to wind down the tension. It is not, however, merely the beginning of the end. Thanking the beings is an important step, powerful in its own right, and should not be rushed or performed absent-mindedly. There are three reasons for this. The first should be obvious. It's simply rude to chase the guests guests away quickly or carelessly. The second reason is every drama needs adequate denouement. The right will feel rushed if all the time spent building up is not balanced by significant time spent winding down. And the final reason is experiencing gratitude is a blessing in itself. Consider that when we feel thankful towards someone, we naturally want to behave better towards them. As Cicero put it, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all the others. In other words, gratitude can bring out the best in us. It can strengthen our desire to live according to the ways of the kindreds. 
It is like a second blessing, or perhaps an early realization of the blessing. Taking time in ritual to fully experience and explore the blessing of gratitude can deepen and strengthen our relationship to the kindreds and to the world. Step 15 is thus nothing to be passed over lightly. In thanking the beings, you should address all the powers thus far involved in the rite, the deities of the occasions, the three kindreds, and any others called upon. You can save thanks for the gatekeeper until step 16 after the gates are closed, and thanks for the earth, earth mother until step 17. Thanking the beings has two functions. First, there is the expression and experience of gratitude discussed above. Second, the step implies that the powers are now free to go and need no longer tarry in the ritual space. So it's a good way to close up shop, as it were, letting the guests be on their way. Note that the thanks expressed in this step is different from thanks for previous boons received, such as success at a new job or recovery from an injury. Such thanks are better given in the key offerings or workings. The thanks of step 15 are specifically for service rendered in the current rite, the role they played, the blessings they offered, and the gift of their presence. So yeah, saying thank you is very important. Yeah. Uh, like you learned in kindergarten, folks. Yeah. <laughs> and it should be something simple, too. It should be, you know, yes, it said you said time of being long. It doesn't have to be super long, but mm -hmm. it should be spoken. Yes. Spoken. Like, I, like you say to a good friend leaving, mm -hmm. you want to say thank you, and it could be very, very easy. Mm -hmm. um, there's tons of examples, and simply it could be like, Avrij, for your gifts of inspiration, go Magath, we thank you. Mm -hmm. Or using some sort of the language, it, whatever the heart culture mm -hmm. is in that, but it could simply be, yeah. we thank you. And we have everybody say, we thank mm -hmm. you on, on all of our behalf. Yes. Um, and I, it can be... It a lot of times we actually end up in our specific uh, ritual scripts, we end up leaving that sec section kind of blank and just let the things come to us at the end. I know for Beltane, I wrote out a specific thank you for the she, and that was just not going to happen when the actual thanking came around because there was so much that the she had done at the right that I had to address that specific thing. So I definitely came up with something on the cusp of the moment for that. Yeah, I, I don't know what else to add to the thanking. It's just, it's thanking. It's thanking. It's thanking. So step 16, closing the gates. Once all the beings present via the gates have been thanked, it is time to close the gates. The energetic nexus created by opening the gates is thereby neutralized. Time and space return to normal, mundane capacity. A space sanctified to the divine is not left behind, so no, so one need not worry about desecration of the space by later casual use. Of course, even after the gates are closed, we retain a connection to the kindreds. They can always hear us, even as we go from the ritual into the world. So in addition to deconstructing the space, the closing of the gates also constitutes thanking and bidding farewell to the gatekeeper. If you invoked the gatekeeper and opened the gates as one action, then you can do the same with closing and thanking. If you invoked the gatekeeper and opened the gates separately, then for the sake of symmetry, you may as well close the gates and thank the gatekeeper separately as well. A basic way to do it is say, gatekeeper, we thank you. Mm -hmm. And then go ahead and start closing the gates. Uh, Columbia, how we do it is we start having people chant, like how we had people chant, open the gates. We start people chanting, close the gates, close the gates, close, close the, the gates. And then we all start saying, like, for instance, Janos, for holding the ways open for us. We thank you. Now, Janos, let the well be but a pot of water. Let the fire be but a simple flame. Let the tree be but a stick in a pot. Let all that was before is again. Let the gates be closed. Everyone will say, let the gates be closed. closed. And it could be simple like that. Uh, or you could be we're, as... We're rather a, showy about the way we do it. But. Yeah, <laughs> whenever we're running around, we're doing all kinds of things. We're very theatrical yes. on this. Uh, but it could be very simple. It could be very poetic. Mm -hmm. Or it could be very drawn out. It's mm -hmm. all up to you. And again, there's more examples online with that. Um, there's some of them that are quite long. 
if that's something you would like to do, go go forth and do that. More power to you. I know for me, by the time I'm getting to the closing of the gates, I kind of I'm so tired. I've been doing this for an hour, hour and a half by now. I I like my closing of the gates to be pretty simple. Yeah, it's it, <laughs> by this time it is about an hour and twenty, hour and thirty yeah. minutes. So everyone is getting tired, but we will still want to be respectful, regardless mm-hmm. of how oh, tired. Oh yeah, oh, totally, totally. And we're just not going to build another right on the closing <laughs> of the gates. <laughs> so the gates are closed. We walked through the gates, and we're now back into our realm. The gates have been closed, and now we're back in the midworld. And now we're at step 17, thanking the Earth Mother. Now the ride is almost over, but one being remains to be thanked, the Earth Mother. A traditional way to do this is to take any remaining offerings and whatever remains in the blessing cup and give them to the Earth. This way we give due honor to our home and support, and nothing goes to waste. This step serves two functions. First, it expresses gratitude to the Earth Mother for the support. And second, it uses up all the remaining offerings. To thee we return this portion of thy bounty, O our Mother, even as we return unto thee. If you really want to be poetic. Yep. It's essentially we're just we're offering the rest, making two offerings to the Earth Mother. Plus, if you have offerings that you've set aside specifically for this rite, you don't want to take that back and reuse that. So now you have yeah. this opportunity. The idea is anything that's unopened, you want to make it the additional offer. Yes. To. So that is step 17. And last but not least is step 18, closing the right. Just as effective. Ooh. What is that? <laughs> Just as effective ritual starts with a clear cut beginning, so does it finish with a clear cut ending. The function of the closing is to bring all participants completely back to the mundane world of experience. It is not, however, to cease all communication with the kindreds. Even as the worshippers go from the right, they take a part of the right with them. The kindreds are with us always, and step 18 may express this. It's very simple. Very, very simple. Here's an example. Uh, So simply, we can do something very simple with with the musical symbol. Bang, bang, bang. Gods and goddesses, nature spirits, ancestors, we end just as we begun. Children of the earth, this rite has now ended. And then we usually finish off with a song. We have everybody then hold hands and we sing. (laughs) Walk with wisdom from this hallowed place. Walk not in sorrow, your roots shall e'er embrace. May strength be your brother, and honor be your kin. And luck be your lover, until we meet again. We see that a couple times around. We sing that three times. Three times. Because I like the number three. (laughs) There you go, there you go. So that wraps up the core that, order. That's a lot. It is. It's a lot. I and did not realize how long that was going to take us. Oh, yeah. Thank and you so much, guys, for, for hanging out with us and, and bearing with us while we went through all of that. I hope you picked some stuff up. Yeah, and if we if, if we made any mistakes, please email us and we will correct it. Absolutely. ptmpod at gmail.com. Please reach out to us. Yes, please do. So that ends our That's, core order of ritual. We, yep. You might come back to this later by some te- showing some techniques that mm-hmm. we have experimented with, um, but that will probably be in the future because we're going to be stepping away because I think our next episode is going to be Beyond the Gates workshops and interviews. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to be a fun one, you guys. It's going to be full of interviews with at least five different clergy people mm-hmm. as well as some of the workshops. We might actually – we might post some of the workshop separate podcasts mm-hmm. here and there. Yeah, might do some might do some of those as uh, bonus episodes. Actually, as you noticed, we had no bonus episode for June because we had no ritual for June. So I think some, holding on to some of those workshops as bonus episodes might be mm. a good idea. To correct you, yes, we do have a June ritual, but it's already at the yeah. end of June, and we're, we're no way going to get that out yeah. in a day. We're, we're <laughs> definitely recording this episode before. It's it's like two, the, our, our uh, summer solstice ritual is like two, three days before the end of June. So um, so we're not going to be able to get that to you, yeah. but we will have that bonus episode in July. So that yes. will be in the first week Absolutely. of July, so stay tuned for that. So guys, if you, if you like what you hear, please... 
reach out to us. Please, Please review, do. review us so look other people. Look us up on iTunes. Give us stars. Review us. Rate us. Look us up on uh, Stitcher. Uh, the more you talk about us on those devices, the more other people will be able to find us. Yes. And thank you to our fellow listeners. That You guys are awesome. Keep sending your emails. They're awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. Let's uh, go ahead and do our event calendar real fast for you guys. Um, we don't have a whole lot for August, so it's mostly going to be July events. For July 7th through 10th, we have the Beyond the Gates Festival at Trout Lake Abbey in Trout Lake, Washington. Entry is $60, and we will have the website in the show notes. Uh, and you can find you can buy tickets at beyondthegates.brownpapertickets.com. Don't we worry, we will have that in the show notes. July 9th, uh, July 9th, beginning at 11 a.m. and ending at 6 p.m. is the Summer Tides uh, Summer Tides Afternoon of Sun, Sand, Surf, and Psychics. That is a two dollar entrance fee. There will be vendors, psychics, healers, and food, and that's going to be located at It the Broom Fits in uh, Tigard, Oregon. July 14th through 17th is the Eight Winds Festival. Uh, located at, in uh, Truckee, California. Entry is $40. And the website is northwest.adf.org forward slash 8 dash winds dash 2016. Again, don't worry, that's going to be in the show notes. July 16th, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. is the White Owl Social Club Heathen Pub Moot. It's a meet and greet and discussion located at the White Owl Social Club at 1305 Southeast 8th Avenue, Portland, Oregon, 97214. Um, July 30th through July 31st is the second annual Wild Woman Campout. This is a $111 registration fee located in Linen, Sacred Land, Vernona, Oregon. August 7th, Columbia Proto Growth. Hello. <laughs> All right, in August, August 32. So on August 7th is Columbia Grove's Irish Lanasa ritual, which will be honoring Lou. Uh, ritual start begins at 3.30. Location is at West Hills Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. You can find more information on that at columbiaadf.org. Uh, we do apologize for not getting more events in August. We can't seem to find a whole lot. Hey, reminder, if you know somebody that has an event coming up, if you know anybody in the Pacific Northwest that wants to advertise their events, it's not just Oregon. It is Northern California. It is Washington. It is Alaska. It is, what else, Montana? Montana. If you know anybody in these regions... Uh, point them our direction. Have them shoot us an email, ptmpod at gmail.com. We want to be able to advertise your events. We love having this opportunity to do that. So please let us know if you have anything that you want us to, to put out on the podcast. All right, excellent. And also come to Lunasa because I'm looting it and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. We can't. We can't. Uh, we can't pay for people's flights out out here. That's a little expensive. We can't do that. But um, there's there's a TriMet bus train that will take you down to our ritual location. <laughs> <laughs> um, and to wrap it up, I'd like I would like to give a shout out to um, the Pagan Weekly News uh, through Blog Talk Radio. Um, they recently had one of our members, Christina, a.k.a. Mama Gaia, on the show uh, advertising our Beyond the Gates uh, festival, and they also gave a shout-out uh, to the podcast, so thank you for your shout-out. Shout-out back. You guys are awesome. Also, um, check out, there's another podcast that's being produced by um, ADF members as well called Gifts of the Word, W-Y-R-D. Um, Please go go give them a listen, check them out, uh, give them just as much do as you give us because they are awesome, and check it out. So that's us. That's that's everything. That's our shout outs. As a reminder, you can reach out to us at ptmpod at gmail .com. Um, you can look us up on iTunes and Stitcher. We have a fan page on Facebook. Uh, 
Part the Mist podcast. And uh, you can check out our website, ptmpod.lipson.com. And we look forward to getting a chance to talk with you again next month. Yes, it should be exciting because with those interviews and yeah. being at Trot Like Abby, it's going to be pretty fantastic. Yes, I'm super excited for those guys. So I think I'll go ahead and thank Magna Mutter for being here. Great mother. <laughs> she is laughing at us today. <laughs> Great Magna Mutter. Great goddess. For being here this day, we thank you. We thank you. All right, I think that sums it up. Yeah. But until next time, have a great day, night, evening, whatever. Have a happy summer solstice and a happy Lunasa. Yes, I'll see you next time. See you next time, folks. There's an alligator in the house A toothy grin appears beneath my chair A scaly tail goes sliding out of sight Now it's gone, was it ever there? Something odd has moved into the house Reptilian tracks lead underneath the bed And all the cats are tasty, fat, and scared But I don't think we've lost any yet So what's the big deal? Doesn't everyone have an alligator somewhere, somehow? And maybe this one has always been here But I never noticed until now There's an alligator in the house just caught her napping in the living room She was dozing on the velvet couch And the cats were sleeping there too There's an alligator in the house No one seems to mind except for me Well, at least she doesn't eat the cats I suspect she'd rather eat me There's an alligator in the pit She is dancing wildly with the snakes To win them over to her cause She will do whatever it takes They think I don't see their little smiles As they plan reptilian overthrow But I hear them talking in my dreams They will not be sad to see me go So what's the big deal? Doesn't everyone have an alligator somewhere, somehow? And maybe this one has always been here But I know Seems to think they're nice I've counted all of them a hundred times But I never got the same answer twice 
There's an alligator in my bed. She is not a master of disguise. Just a pillow waiting for my head. Soft and sweet and hungrily she lies. There's an alligator in the house. Today she joined me for a spot of tea. She helped herself to raspberries and cream. And she didn't leave any for me. Well, I thought that I had seen it all. But this alligator proved me wrong. Like a lady as she sipped her tea, she sang to me this little song. So what's the But I never noticed until.